Um, so, so next up, we have um, Dr. Shyam Ramkumar, Lead of Business Development and Strategy for North America for Cir at Circularize. Uh, Dr. Shyam Ramkumar uh, is the lead, as I said, I've already given you a job title, 10 years of experience in sustainability and circular economy in Europe and the United States. Previously worked as the Knowledge and Innovation Manager at Circular Economy in Amsterdam, interned at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, and was a sustainability consult uh, consultant with Accenture's Chicago office in the U US. Also heard that he's got a very relevant PhD in the, the work that he's doing, so I'm looking forward to his presentation. Thanks. Got the, uh, swell. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, um, touch upon, I think, some of the things that we were discussing in some of the earlier sessions uh, as well um, around uh, data sharing, uh, availability of data from, from the supply chain, particularly for uh, LCA. Um, so we'll share a bit about Circularize and, and what we do. Um, so we are a blockchain-based uh, supply chain trans uh, traceability um, software solution. and. Uh, uh, we're based in, in The Hague, in the Netherlands. Uh, we were started uh, in 2016, um, growing to a team of about 40-plus uh, uh, employees, and um, recently closed our, our Series A funding round uh, as well. So most of our uh, activity uh, is, in, is in Europe. Uh, we're, we're looking into, into Japan and uh, North America uh, as well. Um, so, you know, what we have seen when it comes to um, the automotive industry and the, and the work that we've been doing is that OEMs have set some some very bold uh, targets for for decarbonization and and recycling, um, and uh, I guess the question now is how they can achieve some of these goals. And uh, some of you have touched upon this in previous presentations in terms of what are the materials that can reduce uh, embodied carbon, what parts are easier to disassemble and recycle, uh, how do you design um, and uh, how does design sort of impact the end of life of vehicles and, and impact the, uh, the footprint? And we believe that by, by tracing uh, supply chains that uh, automotive industry, uh, the automotive industry and OEMs can, can better answer uh, some of these questions. And yeah, as, as you all kind of uh, um, heard from uh, the speaker from Tata Motors as well uh, with the sort of visibility barrier that he mentioned, um, there's really a lack, lack of visibility in uh, many supply chains, not only automotive, beyond tier one and two. There's really a limited understanding of materials and flows. Um, being able to do scope three calculations is quite difficult. Data quality uh, is a big issue. And uh, if you want to get primary data from different companies, there's a, a huge lack of trust in terms of, you know, how are you gonna use this data? What do we want to share? Um, there's no really, uh, no, no incentives to, to do so. Um, and we've seen that a lot of uh, traceability today and, and data gathering today is, is largely done by, by email. So it's uh, getting certif certif certificates and um, uh, reports as uh, PDFs <clears throat> by email. And we see that it's very sort of labor intensive to manage all this information, uh, prone to error, not very scalable, usually quite reactive. Uh, so really, this kind of visibility into the supply chain uh, is one of the biggest barriers uh, to achieving sustainability and, and circularity. And so what, uh, what we do at Circularize is we develop um, digital product passports for, for traceability. And here's an example of uh, what a, a sort of battery passport would, uh, would look like. And so what we do is for different materials, different components, uh, end products like, like vehicles, batteries, et cetera, uh, we create a sort of digital version uh, of that product and try to capture information about it. Uh, things like the, the mass of the product, where it was produced, uh, what are different environmental impacts uh, of that product, uh, and also try to capture the chain of custody. So how was this product created? Uh, who supplied the different materials and components? And try to trace that back uh, upstream in the supply chain. Um, and, and really what we try to do uh, with, with our solution is, is act as that sort of data platform uh, to capture information at each step of the supply chain, all the way from the raw material to the part uh, to when the product is used uh, to uh, the end of life uh, as well. <clears throat> and our ultimate vision is sort of this end-to-end -end traceability so that uh, it's possible to know uh, during the second life or, or subsequent lifetimes of products how do you trace that back to uh, the origins in terms of where those materials came from, if it was recycled, which products was it recycled from, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, and so this is an example of, uh, of a, a project we did. I'll, I'll share a video later on in the presentation uh, as well. But what we basically do is create these digital product passports for every uh, material, part, uh, and component uh, across the supply chain. And so in this example, um, we have some, some material created by, by Domo. Um, and you're able to see, for example, the information that they shared in terms of the name of the product, the manufacturing site, the recycled content, and how that ended up into uh, a particular vehicle. So we do this at a, at a batch level. Uh, so this particular batch of material was created on this date at this facility and found its way into this specific uh, vehicle. And, and it was produced here. Uh, this is the quantity of material that, um, uh, that found its way into a car, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, what are the benefits of, of this kind of, uh, these kind of passports? It really allows companies to um, understand the sourcing uh, of their materials upstream in the supply chain, not only from a tier one perspective, but uh, beyond, and allows them to um, better understand what is the sort of CO2 footprint, uh, get information to perform some of these LCA calculations beyond just using uh, industry averages, um, and really try to capture data for certifications and other sustainability uh, metrics. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, regulations coming up, particularly in Europe, that we're tracking around uh, battery, fra battery passports, digital product passports in general, uh, the German Supply Chain Act, uh, to try to understand the due diligence uh, of your suppliers. So really for some of those um, regulations that are there and are upcoming, it really allows companies to have the sort of uh, evidence base necessary to comply with these, uh, these regulations. Um, and what we see is that, you know, with a lot of these um, passport solutions or data sharing solutions, there's a, a few challenges in terms of gathering this information. Uh, on the one hand, there's sensitive data that companies might not want to share. Um, so there's an issue of confidentiality and, and privacy. Um, there's a potential for um, submitting fraudulent or misleading data or even double, uh, double accounting. And uh, there's also concerns around uh, interoperability. Uh, and so the way we sort of address some of these, um, these challenges, <clears throat> and I'll go through it in, in subsequent slides, is um, we try to um, develop our solution in a way that gives control over the data and the disclosure to the companies, to the suppliers, so they can choose what they want to share with whom they want to share it. Um, and then when it comes to sort of fraudulent or misleading data, um, since we're built on the public blockchain, Essentially, once the data is on the blockchain, it can't be tampered with, it can't be altered, it can't be changed. So um, companies that receive that information have confidence in knowing that uh, that information has been validated and has not been uh, tampered with. <clears throat> and, and lastly, since we're built on uh, the public blockchain, and I'll um, share a slide that goes into it in more detail, we address this issue of interoperability. And some of you touched upon this in, in earlier uh, talks as well, where I think there was discussions around supplier fatigue where you have to submit information to multiple customers or multiple industries. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, with a lot of different industries, they're developing sort of traceability solutions or, or passporting solutions um, that are particular to that industry. And what we have done is we've built uh, our solution on open protocol so that that data can be more easily exchanged between different passporting solutions, between different uh, industry requirements, et cetera. Um, so yeah, this kind of slide over, uh, pr provides a bit of an overview of, of what is unique to the way that we've built out our solution. Uh, so since we're built on the, the public blockchain, uh, it really allows for that decentralization um, and security. Uh, the, the kind of pitfalls with the uh, public blockchains, of course, is this issue of privacy and confidentiality, <clears throat> which is why we kind of um, built out uh, something we call smart questioning. And I'll go into that in, in subsequent slides, but that's really that ability for uh, companies to choose um, who they want to access information that they're sharing. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, uh, the, the open infrastructure aspect of public blockchains allows us to be interoperable to multiple systems. So even if, for example, Circularize goes out of business, uh, all of that information is still on the Ethereum uh, public blockchain, which we use, and can be accessed uh, in the future. So. Uh, the solution isn't dependent on, on us necessarily. Uh, so with, with our smart questioning uh, technology, it really allows uh, companies to sort of adaptively control who they uh, disclose the information to. So 
They can choose, for example, to completely disclose the information publicly, make it publicly available, um, make it fully uh, available to approved organizations in a particular supply chain, in a particular industry. They can also set uh, a membership requirement. So uh, they can say that information is only available to people within a particular membership list. Um, they can also choose to share information in a range-proof way. So what this means is instead of sharing the exact percentages of, for example, particular chemicals that they use, they can choose to say that um, we uh, can only tell you that the, this particular chemical does not cross a certain threshold, so it's not above 5% or 20%. Uh, or they can choose not to share any information at all. So if they deem certain data points as um, extremely confidential or private, they can choose um, not to share that. Uh, so this is kind of how uh, it, it looks in terms of the different data points. The, the different information that can be gathered in these passports can also be aligned with some established frameworks, whether they're uh, standards <coughs> uh, like ISO standards or, or GHG protocols, whether they're certifications, um, uh, standards like uh, certifications like ISCC, um, RSB, whether they're regulations, so like the EU battery directive uh, and others, or specific uh, requirements from the from the supply chain. Uh, so, you know, for each of these data points is an example of, of the battery passport <coughs> data points, some of which are required by the EU battery directive. Uh, you can capture things like uh, state of health, state of charge, um, expected lifetime, physical dimensions, general battery information. Um, and so, yeah, for, for all of these data points, because they're required by the regulation, we can um, choose that companies sort of have to uh, fully disclose. But um, for other information that uh, companies deem too sensitive, they can choose not to fully disclose, but um, go with one of the other disclosure levels uh, that, I, that I shared. <clears throat> so this is what um, it looks like in terms of how this information flows. Essentially, uh, we don't um, control uh, or, or store the information on our, on our systems. Uh, companies kind of retain their information, and what we do is we uh, create a hash or a reference to that data um, on our blockchain. So essentially through our platform, uh, a sort of um, reference to the information is created. So when um, company B, for example, wants to access their supplier's data, uh, company A's data, um, and they want specific uh, qu uh, answers to, to questions, uh, our solution allows them to use our blockchain solution to then reference that information and pull it uh, from company A so they can see the information that uh, is available to them. So I'll, I'll show you what it uh, kind of looks like here. Um, hopefully you're able to read. Um, apology, uh, apologies if, um, if the text is a bit small. But yeah, essentially, for example, uh, company A uh, is able to uh, share different information about things like um, certifications of their site, um, the manufacturer's name, uh, site location, information about the product. Um, so you can see here that uh, they're creating polymer AB. You can see that they um, have some, some information that they've submitted about the cadmium content, uh, fluorescent coating content, um, sourcing composition, some LCA information uh, attached to an LCA report as well, and some batch level information about uh, certifications for that particular batch, including the batch number. Um, and so what we do is basically take this information and hash it on the blockchain um, so we kind of encode it and encode a reference to all this data. So when company B, for example, wants to access this, uh, this data, you'll notice that certain pieces of information are locked. So you'll see that um, company B isn't able to see um, or download certification A. Uh, for the chemical composition, they're able to see that it, they can't see the exact numbers. They can't see the 30% and the 15%. They just know that it's uh, greater than 20% or greater than 10%. Um, and then with the, the LCA data, uh, this particular supplier has chosen not to share uh, the exact um, numbers, but they did uh, share the LCA report. Um, and then same with the batch level certifications. You can see certificate B, but not, uh, but not A. So yeah, essentially, um, companies are able to choose what information they want to disclose and to whom, and uh, companies that want to access this information can only see what's, uh, what's available to them. Uh, and of course, this is done um, on a bilateral level, but if you were to do it across the entire supply chain, uh, it allows us to create visuals like, like this. So here, 
we see the chain of custody for um, a recycled car. Um, so you can see that uh, um, there's different kinds of uh, cars that eventually um, went to be shredded uh, into a, a, a shredding facility. And from that shredding facility, um, different uh, components, uh, materials like steel, aluminum, plastic, et cetera, were extracted. And you can trace that to um, how it was then recycled and how it ended up um, in a, a new sort of recycled car from a, from a factory. Um, here's another sort of a, a example um, when it comes to sourcing composition. So here you can see uh, not only from, from tier one, but uh, beyond, so tier two and, and so on, uh, what is the amount of um, virgin versus pre-consumer recycled versus post-consumer recycled versus bio-based materials are sourced from the supply chain? Uh, so you can see what are the quantities sourced from all your tier one suppliers, uh, where they sourced it from their tier two, and, and so on. And in this particular image, you'll notice that um, some of the information is grayed out. So for those particular suppliers um, in the tier one, two, and three, um, they decided not to disclose information about uh, the recycled content or the bio-based content. So you, you know that they supplied some kind of material, but you don't know what is the sort of uh, quantities of recycled or bio-based. Uh, and so, yeah, what does this mean for sort of LCA? Well, with this kind of information, you're also able to track the carbon footprint uh, of the entire supply chain at a, at a batch level. Uh, so for any particular product uh, produced at a facility at a specific time, you're able to trace it back to see all of the different um, uh, tier one materials and components that went into that product, where that was sourced from in terms of tier two, and so on. Um, and it really opens up the ability to understand um, which are the suppliers or which of the materials or components that are contributing the most to the carbon footprint uh, of your product. So you can kind of do this uh, uh, hotspot analysis to understand what are areas of your supply chain to focus on in order to improve that footprint. Um, and this is going back to um, what the gentleman from Tata Motors mentioned about that more impact-focused approach uh, to decarbonization. Um, and the way we kind of um, approach the, the, the data gathering process is we really try to align um, the approach to uh, different standards. Um, so we've been looking at uh, Together for Sustainability standards, um, uh, the Pathfinder framework, ISO standards, and, and GHU protocol for the chemical sector to kind of create a bit of a framework for how this information gets gathered uh, from the different suppliers. So. Um, you know, some of the conversations we had earlier were about um, uh, harmonizing some of these standards uh, and making sure that, um, you know, there's, there's data points that we get from these harmonized standards versus data points that are specific to different, different industries. So um, our solution is entirely customizable. So as these conversations develop and certain standards get prioritized over others, we're able to change the data requirements to align ourselves to those standards that are more accepted in, in particular industries. And the ultimate idea is to create a sort of standardized way to gather this information from the supply chain so they're able to provide the necessary data points that are required uh, in order to calculate uh, carbon footprint and, and perform uh, LCA calculations. Um, and yeah, essentially, um, for each of these different data points, uh, you can kind of set those disclosure levels. Companies can choose what they want to share in what capacity um, so that we can then get a better understanding of what are those data gaps, which are the suppliers that um, are providing information, and once they do, where are the different uh, hotspots in the supply chain. Uh, and you're also able to capture sort of metadata. Um, so, you know, if um, you want to know information about how much of the information provided by these companies is uh, primary data versus industry averages that they use, or whether um, there has been any sort of third-party review conducted, uh, all of that information can also be captured, and you can also see whether the information provided by the suppliers has been verified by any third parties, uh, or if it's just information that's been sort of self-reported uh, by the companies. Um, and yeah, in addition with our solution, of course, you know, it's impossible. I think one of the, um, the speakers was mentioning the, the need to, to do more automation and integration. Um, uh, and so what we're able to do is also integrate our solution with different ERP systems to try to capture as much data from um, 
existing uh, databases within companies um, to make that process as seamless as possible, uh, to pull or push um, specific information that they already have and, and integrate it into our, into our solution. Um, and you know, with these APIs as well, we're also able to transfer this data out to uh, LCA software as well. So if you want to capture all of the different emission factors across your supply chain and then import that into uh, LCA solutions for more detailed calculations, uh, it's possible to do that. So our solution is purely just a, a sort of data gathering uh, tool. So we don't perform any uh, detailed LCA calculations or, or make any sort of recommendations in, in that way. Um, but what we are able to do is provide you with the information in order to perform those calculations uh, outside of our tool. Uh, so, you know, what are the advantages of this kind of trace of these kind of traceability solutions for, for LCA um, and, and PCF? Um, it really, the fundamental aspect of it is um, being able to gather um, data efficiently from your supply chain. So how do you gather information from your suppliers, uh, not only in tier one, but beyond, uh, in a way that doesn't require calling them or exchanging lots of emails um, to get that primary data. Uh, and it's also focusing on data quality as well. So how do you make sure that you're able to get access to this primary information from these companies? And uh, in a way that you can also have uh, certain confidence that the information has been validated by uh, auditors or third parties, uh, so you know the information is, is accurate. Um, and really to get that visibility beyond your tier one. So if you want to do any hotspot analysis, do any analysis of where your supply chain impacts are coming from, you know that um, you can focus on not only <clears throat> your relationships with your tier one suppliers, but beyond uh, as well. And then in terms of you know, future applications uh, or potential applications of this data, really the, the ability to import and export uh, this data to and from uh, LCA tools, uh, potentially also importing it into um, product design tools as well, uh, if you want to think about how to improve future iterations of products um, by, by uh, taking into account this kind of analysis. Um, and really being able to sort of track improvement over time. Uh, so, you know, I showed you all some of the visuals for particular batches, uh, but it's possible to also visualize that across multiple batches and do that over time as well. So you can see how your operations are sort of improving from a uh, carbon footprint perspective. Um, and you can kind of get a, a holistic view of uh, the sort of data quality that you're receiving from your supply chain as well to see where the, the data gaps and uh, where you want to kind of start reaching out to your supply chain in order to uh, get more information. Um, so yeah, here's an example of, of what we did for, uh, for Porsche. Um, we worked with uh, their supply chain with Domo, Covestro, uh, Asai Kasai, PPG, Sika, Mitsubishi Chemical, <clears throat> and we also worked with uh, UL uh, to audit and validate this, uh, this data. So in the end, uh, what you see here is sort of a demo that we designed in terms of how this kind of comes together for the Porsche Taycan. Uh, so you see for the final product in the passport, you can see the mass balance of uh, all the different parts and components, information about where this particular vehicle uh, was manufactured. You can look inside the car, for example, with the inner tube, um, the black polymer for that inner tube uh, produced by Domo Chemicals. This is the quantity of that material that went into the car. You can see information about where that product was manufactured, what is the recycled content, uh, renewable energy usage, um, global warming potential, water usage, et cetera. And all this information was provided uh, by Domo. So this is all primary data provided uh, by them. Um, looking also at things like hazardous materials, et cetera. And you can also see the history of, of when this material was uh, produced and generated and then sent uh, to be put into the, into the vehicle. Um, and then, yeah, another example, going back to the, uh, the inner tube, you can see that uh, there's a red primer that was used, uh, produced by PPG. And you can also see information about uh, that material. And you notice that some of this information is grayed out. So that information, like uh, recycled content and non-renewable energy usage, uh, was chosen not to be disclosed by PPG. So that's why you can't, uh, can't see that, uh, that data. Um, yeah, and, and like I said, you can kind of uh, trace when exactly that particular batch of material was, was sent to be put into that particular car. Um, yeah, so this is a, a short overview of, um, of some of the companies that we've worked with. We mainly work in the, uh, the chemical industry, the automotive industry. Um, 
have been having some conversations in the aerospace uh, industry as well to see how we could apply some of our traceability solutions to really help companies gain greater visibility into the supply chain and be able to better um, monitor it and, and calculate the environmental impacts. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for uh, um, giving me a chance to share what we're doing and looking forward to any, any questions you have. Great, uh, really interesting uh, presentation. Um, so we've got a question online first, uh, which is asking about if the supply chain is analyzed at a batch level, can you elaborate a little bit more on how the integration with the systems work at a company level? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> essentially, uh, the way our sort of API integrations work with different ERP systems is that if uh, companies capture production level information, <clears throat> uh, of their operations, we're able to pull in that information. So whenever a batch gets created, it doesn't have to be manually uh, sort of entered uh, on our platform. So if they're capturing any of the information that's required for the digital product passports, things like manufacturing site, uh, batch number, uh, and if there's already information captured about uh, environmental impacts um, of that product type, for example, we're able to pull in all that information automatically. So once that um, physical batch gets created at that facility, uh, a digital version can be created at the same time. Cool. Any any questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, I, I also thought a lot about this whole thing. Um, what, what I didn't quite connect to is what's the physical tracking method to for so oh, thank you so that when uh, what is the method for when um, it, that creates that physical length of material moving through the chain that gets that. That, that allows data to get entered. That, that's the part. I mean, is there RFID involved? Is that is that the main way? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so it can be um, different kinds of tracking methods. It could be a QR code uh, that's on the um, the container. Uh, if it's a, a chemical, for example, or if it's a battery, it can be a QR code on the battery. Uh, RFID. There's different kind of um, ways to to do that tracking to make that link between what particular batch ends up at which particular facility so that gets tracked and recorded. So just fast forwarding a little bit, um, you, you talked about PPG. Um, so, so say in the future, um, they're providing to lots of different uh, customers. Um, do you see that maybe certain customers are using your solution? Um, but there are also other customers using a different blockchain, a different solution. H how do you envision this for someone like PPG? Are, are they going to be providing this data to all these different levels of, of that to manage all the various different supply chains that they're supporting? That's a good question. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's what uh, um, I mentioned in terms of what we're seeing in regards to different traceability solutions that are now currently largely being built in a private blockchain, so you kind of have to be in that closed network, in that group, in order to share that data. And the approach that we took is more to do it on a public uh, blockchain using an open protocol approach. So even if you use a different blockchain solution, it doesn't have to be circularized, it could be a, another competitor of ours or a different platform. Uh, because all the information is hashed on Ethereum, uh, we're able to share that protocol with the uh, computing platform, so they're still able to access that information and can read all of the, the data points that have been hashed on the, on the blockchain. Um, so as long as they have that open protocol and they, and they know how to decode that information, they're able to access all of that, that data, including the disclosure levels. Chris? Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I learned a lot. Um, my question was, I mean, the Porsche example, that's a very simplified version of a very complex reality, right? So the same batch may go into different facilities and then into the multiple uh, vehicle models, right? Because they share a platform or they share parts with each other. Are you saying you can trace it down to the individual car that is being produced or saying X percent went into this model and Y percent into that model? Yeah, exactly. So since we're tracing it at a batch level and at a facility level, so we, if we take, for example, the, the batch of Domo chemicals, we know that it was sent from this particular facility to this uh, factory. 
Um, and so then we're able to tra track what parts were produced from that factory and where those parts ended up in terms of which particular vehicles from another factory. Um, so as long as the, the company is able to kind of um, provide information about the batches that they produce and have information about the, um, like if they tag the QR code of the particular inputs they receive, we're able to know that inputs from this particular facility went to this particular facility, and these are the products that were produced as a result of those inputs. So we're able to kind of match up uh, that chain of custody along the supply chain at a, at a batch level. Okay, and then, sorry, one more question. Um, so blockchain is known to be crazy energy intensive, right? So <laughs> I'm just wondering, using a technology uh, that uses a lot of energy to pull in data on carbon footprints. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's, so that's especially if, let's say, the whole automotive industry would at some point use this, the computational requirements would be immense, right? No, you're right. Uh, we actually um, have an LCA expert um, that, we, that we brought on board our team, and, and his, his master's project actually was to, to do an LCA analysis of our own platform. Um, so there's a few, I think, de recent developments that reduce that concern a bit. Uh, one is the fact that we're using the Ethereum public blockchain, which recently moved to um, proof of stake, I believe, instead of proof of work. Uh, so that massively reduces the, uh, the energy usage. Uh, another advantage is with our platform, we try to bundle uh, transactions as much as possible um, so that not necessarily every single update or change on the platform is recorded on the blockchain. So we try to also optimize the amount of transactions that happen on the blockchain. So we reduce the energy usage there uh, as well. Um, and as we get better at it and as the technology sort of improves from an energy perspective, uh, that'll significantly reduce the, uh, the impact as well. Whoever did the data visualization on your software, like, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, the data visualization was on point. Um, so a couple of questions. So first question that I had was uh, integration to the LCA software. You mentioned it can be integrated. Are there any softwares which you have already tried and it was good to go or piloted it with some softwares where it was good to go? And my second question was uh, the databases, right? I mean, this at the end of the day would rely on how many companies actually sign up on your platform and put their data in it and it'll become richer and richer and richer. So so where do you see uh, circularize right now in your journey as in, you know, is it still at an early stage? You have a few automotive companies on your platform and then when, when do you reach the inflection point when your database would become more and more richer? Yeah, those Thanks. are very good questions. Um, so to answer your first question, uh, we're actually in a, uh, an EU project with, uh, with MinViro, um, focusing on uh, the rare earth metals uh, industry uh, to see how uh, our solution can work with um, uh, their software to really do some of those LCA calculations um, and, and be integrated. Um, and, uh, and yeah, in terms of our sort of roadmap for the product in the future, we're exploring to see how our solution can be made available to export some of those emission factors in a format that can be more easily integrated into, uh, into LCA tools. Um, and then to, to your second uh, question, you're right. Um, to get that kind of visibility for the entire supply chain, it does require a lot of companies to be on the platform to provide that data in a standardized way or to use sort of similar tools that use our sort of uh, that open protocol that I mentioned uh, so we can access that, uh, that information. Um, at the moment, a lot of the work that we've been doing has mostly been proof of concept. So the, the Porsche example that you saw, uh, as you rightly said, is a sort of simplified example of what is, is possible. Uh, but what we're seeing now is that um, I think a lot of uh, companies are still trying to grapple with exactly what this technology is and how it can be used for supply chain visibility. Uh, so a lot of the work that we're doing is really trying to educate people about what blockchain is, what it enables, and what are the possibilities that can be activated if you get your supply chain on a platform like this. Um, that's also how we sort of work with a lot of uh, companies that we work with. We kind of start with that proof of concept before 
discussing with them how we operationalize it uh, across their supply chain. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, we're seeing that because of the urgency of regulations, at least in Europe, and, and how that has these sort of ripple effects across the global supply chain, more and more companies are realizing that they need to sort of, sort of act quickly to get these kind of traceability solutions in place to be able to answer uh, some of the questions are getting asked from regulators, but also um, uh, being able to sort of future-proof uh, what they're able to do at a supply chain level. So um, we're seeing that kind of accelerating the interest in these kind of technologies, um, and, and companies are getting interested in seeing how they could kind of use it be, or be part of it. Great, we've got another, another question. This is uh, Nic Nicholas Hansen from Boeing. Um, you mentioned that uh, for your platform system, the expectation would be for the supplier to maintain the data record, which would be pulled through your platform. Um, what kind of data storage requirements do you anticipate companies needing to um, have in place to, to engage in this platform? And uh, what kind of plans do you expect there to be for data retention requirements? if it's storing a record for every single batch? Yeah, uh, no, that's a good question. I mean, um, typically a lot of the, the companies that we work with are um, large enough that they usually have some kind of ERP system uh, in place. Um, I, I was eavesdropping on a conversation, I think, um, between uh, two people in the, in the audience, the, the fact that maybe some smaller suppliers that are more mom and pop shops might not have the, the data systems uh, in place to capture all this information. Um, and if they're operating at a sort of low enough volume, perhaps they could get somebody from their team to enter this in information uh, manually on our, on our platform. Um, but um, yeah, essentially, you know, uh, the, the DPPs kind of provide a, a list of data points that um, is being requested by the supply chain. So hopefully that also provides a bit of a guide for some of these companies that don't have data platforms in place to understand what kind of information they should be capturing because of regulatory reasons or because of um, interest from their consumers. Uh, so they can start creating some of those um, data platforms for their own internal uh, operations. I don't know if that, that answers your, your question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. A very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I really appreciate it and a lot of interesting insight. I have a question maybe very simple question, but in the end, when you your experience towards the OEM and uh, the car manufacturers, um, who is uh, who is using this data and uh, and how are they using it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, so the uh, the Porsche example that you that you saw, um, there's a sort of uh, consumer facing part of our of our solution as well. So we have a, a platform. Um, a website where you can access all the different uh, passports. So what we were seeing from a lot of the manufacturers or the f um, final uh, product uh, producers uh, is the, the ability to sort of communicate their product to consumers and being able to highlight some of their sustainability story, uh, some of their supply chain impacts for them to make uh, better decisions as, as consumers. So um, that's been their sort of interest to use this data to, to boost their um, uh, sort of environmental credentials or profile, et cetera. Um, and at the same time, you know, because of a lot of these uh, upcoming regulations in order to report to regulatory agencies on things like the material composition of batteries or um, the uh, composition of different products uh, as the battery passport regulations, or sorry, digital product passport regulations come up. Um, from that perspective, these kind of solution, uh, this kind of solution um, helps these companies prepare uh, that information to provide to regulatory uh, agencies. So that's been another interest as well. But it's not only the, um, the producer that has been interested in our solution. So the project with Porsche actually came about because we were first working with uh, Covestro and Domo, uh, who are suppliers of Porsche, and we were working with them on circularity in the plastic supply chain uh, to get them to see how they could improve the visibility uh, of the impacts of the plastic supply chain and sort of Porsche got wind uh, of, this, of this project um, and the fact that we were working with our suppliers and got interested in uh, seeing how traceability could, could work from them, for them. So yeah, what we're seeing is that not only the, um, the end product, the final product producers are interested, but um, essentially everybody in between is also kind of interested in understanding um, 
what does their supply chain look like and how can they also show to their customers uh, how their product is more sustainable than others and provide that kind of visibility. We've got another question here. Yeah, that, that, that plays into, I guess, my question was going to be asked, how's it, who's driving this? Is it the suppliers that are pushing to say, here, here's an open book of what, you know, showing our data and, and giving that available, as yep. opposed to an OEM sort of requiring it from all their suppliers to use, say, your platform to provide them the information? How do you see that sort of growing? Do you see OEMs getting more interested in dictating platforms, or do you see more suppliers just trying to get ahead of the curve and saying, here, here's the data. If you want to access it, you're going to need to use this platform. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think it's a different by different industries, uh, in different industries. So in, in the chemical industry, we're seeing that some of the, the chemical producers and suppliers are more interested in traceability solutions so they can show their customers how their particular uh, chemical or product is better than, than others, and they're able to sort of trace it to show those impacts. Um, and then, yeah, in the automotive industry, I guess the experience is m more, I guess the OEMs driving that initiative to get information from their sort of suppliers. And of course, there's, I think we were talking about the fact that, of course, a lot of these industries are linked together uh, as well. So there's probably interfaces between uh, the chemical industry and, and the automotive industry. Um, so yeah, we're essentially seeing how um, it's also driving some of the companies in the middle that are kind of sandwiched between uh, some of these chemical producers and some of these OEMs. Uh, that are getting requirements from both sides, so they also need to sort of step up their game uh, to, to trace their supply chains. Cool, so we have a final question online. Um, do you see some data coming in from power electronics, motors, drivers, industry? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think um, there's probably some requirements in terms of some of the automotive OEMs that we work with for those particular components. Um, but I think so far we haven't um, really focused on that um, aspect of the supply chain in detail. It's always been in the context of how does that fit into yeah. the automotive industry or, or other industries. Nice. And, and the joint project that we have is focused on the rare earth value chain. A lot of those uh, permanent magnets will end up in e-motors. So. Exactly. Cool. Brilliant. That's great. Thanks very much.